Good morning, everybody. I think we're, we're ready to go. I hope everyone can uh, see me and hear me. I will wait for some thumbs up on the little bottom left-hand corner. As you can imagine, this is fairly new to me. And um, I'm learning a lot during what is a, a tricky period. And, and most importantly, I hope you're all safe and well. And I hope you're all looking forward to the resumption of racing, which, which across everything looks like it's going to happen uh, on June the 1st. We're waiting for absolute confirmation of that. But the great thing is that racing is ready to go. I think the BHA have done the most fabulous job uh, in getting racing set to go as and when the government gave the green light. And ITV are ready to go. So basically, welcome to the ITV Racing Studio. Things I'd, I'd, That's something I'd never thought I'd say in a million years. I can give you a little tour uh, for those watching. This is where you're going to watch classics from next weekend because ITV have literally in the last few minutes, minutes released the schedule uh, for next weekend. We're going to go from famine to feast very quickly in racing terms because we start broadcasting on Friday the 5th of June, first three days at Newmarket, all live on ITV from here. This is where I'm going to be presenting from. So this is going to be the worst tour ever, but bear with me. Get my thumb out of the way. That's my backdrop. That is the ITV racing backdrop. My Southampton posters had to come down. I'm a big Southampton fan. That's what's going to be behind me. And then if we go around this way, you'll be able to see the kit that I will be presenting too. Now, that's my monitor, my key monitor, which shows the output on ITV. And just look at all the wires and kit below it. And then I've got a second monitor, which again shows Francesca. I'll be on a Zoom call to Francesca and I'll be able to see when she wants to speak and so on and so forth. Ignore the exercise bike uh, behind, but this is very much remote broadcasting. And that white camera there in the middle of the screen is what I will talk to. And I've just got to hope that everything works, that my Wi-Fi stays up. Because on that camera, I am effectively going to be speaking to rather a lot of people. When you think that we had 4.6 million people watching the virtual Grand National, just imagine how many people we might have watching the 2,000 guineas live on ITV next weekend presented from here. And I'm going to be presenting from here. Francesca Kamali will be in her house in Newmarket. Jason Weaver will be in his house in Newmarket. The director will be at his house. The director's assistant will be at her house. And the editor um, will be at his house as well. So we'll all be working remotely in the safest possible environment to bring you live racing for the first time in a long time, which is all very exciting. We hopefully will do a good job. We've got one more rehearsal to do before we'll be ready to go live uh, next weekend. We'll probably do that with live racing wherever that is next Wednesday or Thursday next week. So by Friday... Hopefully, Touchwood will be ready to go on the latest step in a journey I'm going to tell you about this morning. What I'd really like to hear from this morning are your questions, um, because I feel a little bit like Dominic Cummings here, because I'm sure the questions will be hard, but I've got nothing to hide. So I will give you very honest answers as well. So please fire in your questions to me about anything you want. The season ahead, the journey we've been on on ITV that I'll talk about for 10 minutes or so. Anything you want to know about ITV, about racing, just let me know and I will try and answer as best I can. These are unusual times, they really are. And I think the next few weeks are honestly the best opportunity for racing and arguably the most important few weeks for racing for a very long time. I interviewed the owner Steve Parkin yesterday and he said that, he made me nervous actually about the responsibility I've got on terrestrial television. He said this is the opportunity of a lifetime for racing to sell the thrill, were the words he used. I thought it was a brilliant line, sell the thrill. And I'm gonna try and sell the thrill of racing to a new audience because there will be new people watching. This is a time when racing will have the sporting landscape completely to itself. What an opportunity we have got to sell our wonderful sport and get more people involved um, with it. And that is my plan and we'll do it to the best of our ability. And this is a journey in racing that began for me in January of 2016. I was uh, very happy broadcasting Premier League football on Sky Sports. I was uh, the face of Super Sunday and Monday Night Football, two shows that broadcast the Premier League. And I worked with the likes of Graham Souness and Jamie Redknapp and principally Gary Neville and Jamie Carragher on Monday Night Football. Was I looking to do something else? No. Did I fancy the challenge of racing? Yes. So when that phone call came, I remember it so well in, in the January of 2016, I thought, I really fancy doing that. I was very happy doing the fa uh, football, but I really fancied doing the racing, because racing's where I started out. I, I got on the BHB, as it was then, in the mid-90s. I got on their graduate scheme. I wanted to work at the race courses. I got sent 
uh, to Labrooks, which at that time I thought was an absolute disaster, but I absolutely loved it. I was at Labrooks for three and a half years in the end. And then my, my career took a different path. I became an editor of a magazine, some of you might remember actually, um, called Sports Advisor magazine. I became the editor. So I went from being a bookmaker to an editor overnight. Racing was a big part of that. And I went on Bloomberg TV to promote my magazine from Bloomberg TV. And this is where, for everyone really, particularly youngsters I speak to, you need a bit of luck in life, but you've also got to take your opportunities. Because so I went on Bloomberg TV, did the best I could, and Sky Sports picked me up from there and said, come in, we'd like to have a look at you. I did a trial for Sky Sports and things rolled from there. And the shows I did started to get a bit better. And then in 2010, a big scandal broke, which some of you might remember with Richard Keyes and Andy Gray, who were the face of Sky Football. And they left pretty promptly because that was front page news for a while. And I was 14 to one. I remember it well with Paddy Power to get the big job at Sky. Never thought I'd get it in a million years. And I did, my, did the first few matches, which were terrible. I was useless, but I gently got better. And in the end, I was offered the big job. I remember being called into the, the boss at Sky's office and they said, the good news is you are now the presenter of our main football shows. The bad news is you're going to be working with Gary Neville. And at the time I thought, oh, no, because he was the most unpopular footballer for you non-football people. Gary Neville was pretty much the most unpopular footballer in the country. Man United through and through, love winding people up. And now I was going to be his co-host. And we didn't get off to a great start, but in the end we were flying along. We, we won a few awards and it went really well. So why would I leave Premier League football to come to horse racing is a question I get asked in every supermarket I go into. Barely a day goes by on a high street of some description where I don't get asked, why did I leave Premier League football, the biggest sport there is, to work in horse racing? The truth is I was following a bit of a dream. It was my dream to present horse racing. The Grand National was the, the race that got me into the sport. Aldenitis Grand National in 81, if you watched my interview on Racing TV the other day, you'd have seen it, was the race that got me into horse racing with a a mad keen grandfather, a back Spartan missile that day. I was absolutely gutted, but I was hooked from that day. Always used to go to the Grand National. And if you told me then I was one day going to present the Grand National, I said, don't be daft. But I've managed, I've been able to do that. Just the seventh person in history to present that on ter terrestrial television, which is something I'm very proud of. But the start of the journey didn't go so well, if I'm honest. Um, I'd left football in the May of 2016 after Leicester had won the Premier League and then immersed myself in racing, which is, in hindsight was probably a mistake, actually. I didn't need to. Because I like being the person on racing who can ask the questions that people want to know at home. I don't, I, I don't need to impart any information to anyone. I'm the referee. I'm the quarterback. I'm the cajoler, if you like. My job is to get the best out of other people, to get the best out of Johnny Murta, Sir Anthony McCoy, Ruby Walsh, Jason Weaver, all these wonderful people that I get to work with. I don't want anyone talking about me. Uh, I want to stay out of the headlines, if you like. The, the less said about me, the better. I want to just be good at getting information out of other people, which the master at doing that was always Des Lynham. Des Lynham was my absolute hero and he was the best at it by a long way. And listen, I'm not fit to lace Des's boots, but if I can do a 10th as well as him, then hopefully I've done okay. And I've loved doing it, but it was a baptism of fire when we went on air. I'm sure lots of you will remember it. January the 1st, 2017 at Cheltenham, I'd done an interview at every media channel going, every newspaper saying we're going to present outside. We had to be different to Channel 4. It's very important we were different to Channel 4. And Channel 4 were fantastic, did a brilliant job. Um, but the truth is we needed to be different and our brief was to, to increase viewing figures. And we had all sorts of plans which all went out the window on day one at Cheltenham because I was presenting in a monsoon. And I'm a furious preparer. I prepared for weeks for that first day. And then minutes before we went on air, all my notes got washed away in the heavy rain and my iPad stopped working. So I was absolutely stranded. And as a presenter, even if your legs are going like this under the desk, you've got to stay calm. So I just said to myself, eh, stay calm. It's all gone. Just be yourself. Be natural and see how you go. It didn't go great, if we're honest. And Sir Anthony McCoy, who I can say this because we're good friends, is grumpy, isn't he? I'm sure we'll all agree. I hope they're all nodding at home. He's grumpy, but he's extra grumpy when it's cold, even more grumpy when it's wet. You can imagine what he was like that day at Cheltenham. Luke Harvey was pretty much in tears because he was so cold. I remember him saying, this is my dream job and I don't think I can do it anymore. He was so cold and miserable. And it was just an extraordinary day that the next day got absolutely slaughtered by the critics. Newspapers and social media had a right go at me and had a right go at us, the team, the team I put together. And I remember in a Times, Giles Smith describing me as about as exciting as a self-assembly chest of drawers from Ikea. A little bit harsh. My dad said it was a bit harsh on the uh, chest of drawers from Ikea, but there we go. 
I remember being on Andover High Street where I live with my children, walking out and being shouted at across the street, being told I was rubbish. It was a, it was a tough time, if I'm honest, but we had to stand by our guns. We, we needed to be different. And I said to our team, a little bit of a sort of rallying call and, and we created a little bit of a siege mentality of, you know, let's stick, let's stick what we're doing, we can do this. Because I knew I had a really good team in front and behind the camera. And it got better from there, thankfully. You know, week four was the awful many clouds day. Gosh, that was a tough day to present. It really was. One of the hardest days I've ever had to present. Um, but I think that went okay. And Oliver Sherwood saved the situation. Best two interviews I've ever heard in racing were John Dalston when he lost his horse in the King George. That was a sensational interview. But Oliver Sherwood, fueled by vodka, I think, because he was needed to, to be brave. And he, he saved that day for us with the most amazing interview. And turn the whole picture to remember just what a wonderful horse Many Clouds was. It was an extraordinary day. And then our 13th show, would you believe, was the Grand National we won a BAFTA for. Winning that BAFTA changed my life. Best day I've ever had in television. An amazing experience. And for ITV to do that was cool. And from there, it's got better. The viewing figures have been great. What happens now, I don't know, because we've only got six months, would you believe, left on our contract showing racing. So there's a lot of uncertainty at the moment, might have to look for another job, but I've loved doing what I'm doing. And on that journey, we've had horses like Enable. How brilliant has she been for ITV with Frankie Dettori on board? Behind the Queen, I'm often asked who's the most important person in racing. My answer is always the Queen. And we won't appreciate what she's done for our sport until she's no longer with us. She's been just amazing for such a long time. But Frankie Dettori's not far behind, really, his importance to the sport. I need him, he's 49 years young. I need Frankie to go on forever, really. He's so powerful. He and Enable have been brilliant for us. So is Tiger Roll. Tiger Roll's a horse that resonates with people. And over the next few weeks, I need Pinatubo potentially to resonate with people. They won't have heard of him yet in the street, but they might do if he wins next Saturday by eight lengths. And that's, that's my job to get him into people's conscience. But it's, it's a struggle because, you know, racing isn't in the mainstream. Those two horses probably are. But our mantra on ITV has always been to make racing, this great sport that we all know and love, we need to make it accessible to all. And that's what we've tried to do on ITV. You can't please everyone, it's impossible, impossible. In football, it was easy. I had a, a, a match that lasted 90 minutes and I had to fill for two and a half minutes at half time. Racing's the other way around. You know, you get 30 seconds, a minute of action and then you've got to fill for, for ages on air. And you're never gonna please everyone. People don't like the things we do with a social stable, with fashion, but this is all trying to bring people into racing. We don't do it for the sake of it. We do it because we're trying to bring new people into racing. I've been passionate about syndicates. They're so important. Syndicates in racing, just showing ITV viewers, you can get there. It's not a millionaire's playground. You can um, own horses for a small amount of money and enjoy the joy that racing brings. Stable staff have been crucial to what we do and they've been fabulous for us because it brings it home to people. No offence to trainers, but trainers interviews can be a little bit boring at times. I love interviewing stable staff to see their passion for the sport and likewise owners. Now, owners are very important. They're going to get even more important over the next few weeks because they're the ones who are suffering in many ways, the ones who are pouring money into the sport. And they're not going to be able to see their horse run. And I love owners' stories. The ROA has been a relationship I've worked hard with, and they're great now in furnishing me with information about owners. So I can tell stories. People love stories. They love emotional stories. They love human stories. And that's what we try to do on ITV and bring them in to our coverage, which brings me to the importance of the next few weeks, really, from... June the 1st for the sport and then beyond that for ITV. It's the biggest responsibility I've had in my career. I've been in television since 1999 and the next few weeks feel like the biggest responsibility I have had for a number of reasons really when you think about it. Most important is that on the coverage we get the tone right because a lot of people over the last few months really and certainly the last few weeks have suffered an awful lot. And I've got to be sensitive to that. I've got to imagine someone watching ITV's coverage of Newmarket who will be suffering, might have lost a loved one. I can't come out there and say, isn't this great? Racing's back. Let's go all gung-ho for it. I can't, I can't do that. I've got to be sensitive to the situation. I've got to explain, and we as a team have got to explain why racing is happening. Because there's going to be a lot of people tuning into racing from Newmarket who will be thinking... Why is racing happening and the sport I love, be that rugby, be that football, isn't happening? So we need to explain why racing is happening. I also need to explain how we are doing it in conjunction with the rules in the safest possible fashion. I need to explain that I am presenting remotely from the spare room, the room that the sun called my box room. I was very upset about that. 
and there's an amazing amount of media interest in the, the way we're doing it. And I need to explain that well. I need to explain how brilliant the BHA have been. And I need to explain we're doing it in the safest possible fashion. As John Gosden said on Radio 4 in a brilliant interview, again by John Gosden, he said going to a race course is going to be safer than going to a supermarket. And that sort of says it all. And I need to explain that well. And I think the most important thing, apart from selling the thrill of racing and selling our brilliant sport, is to work on the PR of our sport. Because we had a tough time, if I'm honest, post-Cheltenham. Every interview I did in the last few weeks, every time, wherever I've done the interview, I said, should Cheltenham have gone ahead? And, and we've taken a bit of a rap for that unnecessarily because it wasn't us. You know, we were just following the government protocol here. And now I've got the opportunity to get on the front foot with positive PR about how wonderful our sport is, for one, and two, what amazing things our sport has done during lockdown. Everything it's done from what Racing Welfare's done, for example. I think Racing Welfare and Dawn and, and the team, Simone and Gemma, I think they've done an unbelievable job. Unbelievable job. And I hope they've done a good job for you as well. But in terms of PR, they've done a fantastic job. I mean, the furlong factor with the singing, sensational. And Lara Telfer, I'd like to think, will be part of our coverage uh, in weeks and months to come. And maybe Cheltenham, she might sing us in next year. I thought that was genius. And other things like the money that's been raised, Seamus Mullins, stacking shelves in Waitrose, all the other stories of the good that people in racing have done, and other bits and bobs um, that shows racing in a good light. The raw eggs eaten by Sir Mark Prescott, Aidan O'Brien and others, the money raised, brilliant. So I'm hopefully going to do a good job for PR of racing. And it's a big few weeks we've got ahead coming, folks. A fabulous opportunity for racing if we get it right, if we get that sensitivity and tone right, and then hopefully we'll get huge audiences to watch the sport that I'm loving presenting. Hopefully we might get there. It's obviously a very delicate situation with the contract. I'm nervous about it. I'm making preparations for it not happening. Of course I am. It'd be stupid not to with, with the family and so on. But I'd love to present racing for years to come. I adore my job. I feel very lucky to do it. And I feel the next few weeks are just the biggest few weeks for this sport. As Steve Park and the owner said, in a lifetime. That sums it up. That sums up how just how important the next few weeks are. That's enough for me. I'm sure I've bored you stupid with what I've had to say. I think I can scroll through and see a, a few questions from you guys. Keep them coming in. I'll try and answer as many as I can. Joe Bennett says, hi, Ed, no bookies on the tracks. How would you get an SP? That's, again, something we will explain. That's something that will happen. Of course, it is complicated. I wouldn't say it was an area of expertise. That's why I surround myself with brilliant people. Richard Hoyles will be the man on the first show just to explain how the SPs are calculated. It's going to be very weird. Um, having no bookmakers and people at the track. Because I, the plan is at the moment, I'll let you in on a secret, is that I will present the first two weeks from here in my box room. Uh, that'll be Newmarket and the weekend after. And then hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll be at Royal Ascot. And I will be at Royal Ascot. No bookies, obviously, Joe. No people either. No owners, sadly. But I'd love to think I'll be broadcasting for Royal Ascot. No top hat, no tailcoats. I think that would send the wrong message. But... It'll be a very important message we send with Her Majesty the Queen involved. I can't tell you how, but she'll be involved. And you know about how important I think she is for the sport. And my attitude will be thank you to everyone who's kept the country going. Thank you to the NHS. Thank you to the frontline workers. And here's five days of magical sport to give you an escape for just a few hours each day. To give people an escape. And I hope people enjoy Royal Ascot because the programme honestly looks off the charts. It looks absolutely brilliant. But the SP is something we'll, we will explain, I promise. And it's extremely complicated. Another question here. What has racing brought to your career that has been different to football? Crikey. A lot more enjoyment. A lot more satisfaction. Um, I love working for ITV. They're a fabulous company to work for. And I love working within the sport. And storytelling would be the one thing I think is, is different to football. And the connection with the players, which I think is so important as well. In football... And I've got an 11-year-old son who's mad about football. There's no connection at all nowadays with the players in football. They all earn so much money, they don't need to do it. Well, racing's different. When do you see Sir Anthony McCoy ever turn down a selfie or a, an autograph? Likewise, Frankie. Brilliant accessibility to our players. And that works on the broadcast as well. One of the things I'm most proud of, one of our innovations on ITV, has been down at the starts, having Luke Harvey in particular at Ascot at the start, and Mick Fitzgerald at other meetings. And that brings you to the heart of the action. I'll never forget Brani Frost before the Labrits Trophy with her horse. I think it was Present Man has been reshod. And she spoke to Luke Harvey just before the intensity of the cauldron of that race. That's unbelievable access. Jim Crowley before the Nunthorpe with Batash boiling over, jumped off 
Well, they tried to calm him down and Luke didn't force it, but just said, Jim, do you mind having a quick word? And he spoke to Luke Harvey. Oh, made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. That in my old world of football, to answer your question, would be like Harry Kane speaking before the kickoff of a Tottenham or an England game. Unbelievable. So hopefully on ITV, we've brought people close to the players. That's a relationship I'm always trying to build. The way we speak to jockeys after races, the post-race interviews. Because I say to the jockeys, it's so important. Everyone at home has an interest in a horse in the race. They want to know how it goes. Please speak to us. It's been hard sometimes, um, but that's something we're trying to do. And the stories in racing are so much better. And the access to it in, in racing is so much better. And basically, as I'm saying, I enjoy it much more. But I might be presenting football next year again, so I don't want to burn <laughs> too many bridges here. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to answer a question from Amy here. I'm reading these for the first time. Do you have runners on the ground at Newmarket? So if things happen, uh, you can get this um, information. Probably not at Newmarket, Amy. And answer your question. The thing I'm going to miss most, I'm so spoiled in television. I cannot tell you how spoiled, particularly the presenter is. I have wardrobe advice. I get made up. I get my hair cuts. And I get a runner, at least one runner. Sometimes I have two because I can't move because I'm wired in. I'm actually, you can see, this is the contraption, which is called the talk back uh, down here. This is the contraption where I plug in my earpiece and I have people talking at me. If I have one skill, the hardest skill as a presenter is talking whilst being talked at, I have three people talking at me in my ear saying do this next look at this camera next um don't forget to say this then you have timings you have to hit advert breaks and race off times where you get 20 seconds till you need to hit an advert break and i've got to fill those 20 seconds that's the skill of a presenter i wouldn't say i was very good at it but i've learned over time so which means i can't move amy which means i have runners to get information so i'll send them to the weighing room say could you find out about why this is a non-runner or could you find out about why that jockey's been given a ban, whatever it might be, but they also are in charge of getting you cups of tea. They, my vice is Coca-Cola. I always have a can of Coca-Cola a minute before we go on air. I get very nervous. I get very nervous, particularly ahead of a Grand National when I'm speaking to 10 million people. I get very, very nervous and I get, have a can of Coca-Cola. I know it's shocking. I hope my mum's not watching, but I have a can of Coca-Cola just to give me a little bit of a bit of oomph to go on air and I get terribly nervous. So I just have something to, to calm my nerves as well and nerves are a good thing i embrace nerves but we'll have none of that at newmarket amy is the answer to your question but by the time ascot comes i would like to think we'll have people on the ground i'll have a what's called a floor manager making sure the social distancing is going on and, and everything is running smoothly it's a huge operation when you think itv at aintree for example the biggest thing we do would have 270 people working on that and as a as a presenter i am spoiled rotten i can assure you and i'm very appreciative appreciative of it um, Polly wants to know, good morning, would you think about working abroad? Polly, the answer to that question, I've got a daughter called Polly, that's a, a great name. Polly, would I think about working abroad? I've got to keep options open at the moment because, as I say, I'm, I'm very concerned about the, the contract situation with ITV because I think, and I think you'll all agree, racing has to stay on terrestrial television. We're the envy of any other sport I've ever had anything to do with, with our terrestrial presence. Eyeballs means participation. No eyeballs means no participation. There's so many sports where they've lost their terrestrial te television coverage and they lose their stature. Show jumping would be the best example. I remember growing up watching the, the Hickstead Derby was, was appointment to view television on the BBC. Where is that now? I couldn't even tell you when the Hickstead Derby is. So I think racing's got to stay on terrestrial television, whether that's us or somebody else, who knows? And um, will I might have, might I have to do something else next year? Yes, I, I might well have to do something else. Would I work abroad? Yes, I'd definitely work abroad. I'd love to present an Olympics one day, Polly. So I'd, I'd be very happy to go and work abroad to present an Olympics. Would I want to move my family abroad? Not particularly, because I absolutely love Hampshire. And working abroad, the one thing I'd love to present abroad, which I haven't done yet, is the Prix de l'Arc de Triomphe. I've always presented that from a studio in this country. I'd love to be there at the new Paris Longchamp. So the answer to your question is yes. Um, my options are open. If anyone's got a job for me next year, please let me know. I'll send you my CV. <laughs> I'm joking, really. I'd, I'd, one thing I want to do is keep um, presenting racing. Maureen. Hi, Maureen. I want to know... Uh, the job's obviously grumpy and irritates me, blah, 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 blah. The lovely Luke Harvey. The lovely Luke Harvey. Luke Harvey's a star. I'll tell you about our team. You're obviously asking about our team. And AP's grumpy, but he's awesome. And I hopefully I've made... The most satisfying thing I had in football was making Gary Neville and Jamie Carragher the two most unpopular football footballers seem human. And everyone loves them now. And I was able to show they're actually good guys. They're funny. They're like you and I. They... they are family people, they love a glass of wine, and they're normal. They weren't when they were footballers, they wanted everyone to hate them, but in real life, they're normal. Likewise, Sir Anthony McCoy is hilarious. He might be grumpy, but I love him to bits. He's, he's the most generous guy you'll ever wish to meet. The things he does that people don't realise, be it phone calls he makes or 
his generosity, particularly with charities. He's just unbelievable, Sir Anthony. When I was fighting cancer, he gave all the money from the day he rode his 3,000th winner at Plumpton to my fight. And that's just typical of the man. And on TV now, I'm able to show that he's a bit menacing, he's very funny, and he's actually enjoying TV for the first time in his life. For the first time at Cheltenham, he came off and said, after working with Ruby, he said, I actually quite enjoyed that. That's about as big an endorsement you'll get from AP ever. Uh, Luke's lovely. Again, when we put the, the team together, we wanted warmth and likability and people to be different. Luke's a superstar. He's funny, he's engaging, doesn't take life too seriously. Racing's an entertainment, basically. It's not the end of the world. Uh, most of the time, can be at times, but Luke has a warmth and a generosity that is what we're all about, and he's great. And down at the start, the access he, access he gives us is incredible. He'll be there at Royal Ascot in his trainers again, possibly with his top hat on, and he's just been a revelation. He wasn't broadcaster of the year for racing by accident, Luke. He's so talented, and to give you an insight, others on the team, what are they like? I get asked this all the time. Uh, Johnny Murta is just an absolute live wire, bonkers, does absolutely no homework, but I don't want him to. He's my big picture man. He's ridden in those big races. He knows what big moments are like. He can give us a unique insight. Jason Weaver, on the other hand, works incredibly hard, studies every race, and he's a very good judge. And he's been a revelation on ITV. I think he's the most improved, underrated pundit in sport, not just in racing. Francesca's a joy. She works incredibly hard, and her access to the horses over the next few weeks is going to be crucial because we haven't seen these horses for months and months, most of them. Imagine her when we're at Ascot, touch wood, at Ascot, the access she'll give us to those horses will be amazing. Up close to those horses. Obviously, be very careful with the, where the camera works, but that's going to be her zone. And I'll have my zone in a presentation position. She'll have her zone with the horses where she won't be able to move from. But hopefully she will give us unbelievable access to the horses and she's just brilliant at what she does. Ollie's great, talks a lot, very relaxed. Matt Chapman is Matt Chapman. We employ him for a reason because love him or hate him. Most people want to watch him because he chucks grenades in. He's very talented, Matt huge part of what we do. Um, who else? Mick Fitzgerald is just the nicest man in the world. And behind the scenes, we have just incredible people. You know, we've got a BAFTA winning director, won a BAFTA with us, but there's one other BAFTAs who'd never, never watched a horse race before he started um, directing ITV Racing. And that is a strength because he's brought a fresh pair of eyes to the sport, a little bit like me from the outside, which I think is very important because with racing, we've tried to go like that and broaden it because the racing audience is very small, really, when you think about it. And I'm so proud of the figures we've got. And to give you an idea of that, you know, we've, we've, we've pretty much doubled, Cheltenham being the latest thing, we've pretty much doubled in our three years the number of people that watch Cheltenham, and I'm very proud of that. Um, which do you prefer, the casual, sociable approach to racing or the professional presentation? I've missed out a word there from you, Rod. Um, I think the most important approach is to be accessible. You need to be warm, and you need just to be likeable, really, in terms of your presentation. Knowledge is dangerous. As soon as a presenter starts telling you things or feels they need to impart knowledge, they're gone at the game, in my opinion. A presenter should be in the background. And Des, I'll keep coming back to Des Lyon. He never imparted information. He was just brilliant at steering the ship. Sometimes presenting is like driving a Formula One car when you've got panic in your rear. You've got a big situation happening. Many clouds would be an example of that. And other difficult situations I've had. You've got all sorts of instructions coming in your ear. You've got to stay calm. You've got to get the information out and you've got to get the best out of other people and you've just got to stay calm and I always remember in my head I'm saying the viewer is waiting for me I'm not waiting for the viewer and Hugh Edwards is a master of it he wants to buy himself time when you're watching the 10 o'clock news if you ever see Hugh Edwards do that turn over his script he's doing that to buy himself a bit of time because he's probably trying to wait for instruction in his ear where they're going next what interview they're doing next and you have all sorts of of methods as a presenter of buying yourself time um, and I, I do all sorts of things, which I'm not going to tell you because I'll be letting you into my secret. But sometimes you've no idea what's happening next or where you're going next. So you just buy yourself a few seconds. So you then hear in your ear from the producer saying, we're going to go to this DT next or we're going to go to this next or we're going to an advert break next. Um, and that's the skill of presenting. Thinking on your feet in a, in a calm and easygoing fashion is my approach. But listen, TV is, is subjective, Rod. You might like it done a totally different way. I, I do it my way. And I try to be as relaxed and easygoing and warm as I can to the audience and try to give a broad spectrum. And, and racing is a very broad church. You watch ITV and we'll have hopefully millions watching next week. I can't please everyone. That's impossible. But I do the best I can. And I want as many people watching our um, great sport as I can. Derek, what would be your greatest race? I love the Grand National more than any other race um, because that's the race that got me into racing. That's the race I look forward to presenting most of all. In terms of the pre presentation position, Epson's the best place to present. 
because it's like a cauldron at some people either side of the track, the buses with this little strip of grass up the middle, which is the track. Unbelievable buzz to present at Epsom. Derek, the best races we've had on ITV, there have been so many. I think Big Orange's Gold Cup stands out. Uh, Nabel against Crystal Ocean, Native River uh, against Mike Bite. What a Gold Cup that was. The race I'm looking for, I think the greatest race this season will be Kew Gardens against Stradivarius in the Gold Cup. We've got Nabel against Magical to look forward to. Um, the greatest race I've ever seen Gosh, there have been so many. We took in Greatest Guineas the other day. Frankel was the greatest performance you'll ever see, but then I love commentaries, and Graham Goode on Zephonic was brilliant when he watched back that. Um, Cheltenham's always been my favourite place on earth, so so many great races. I could go on Derek for hours, and I've been very lucky to have so many great races, great matchups, and great finishes on ITV, and I think Hugh Gardens and Stradivarius could serve that up at Royal Ascot again. Right, just a few more minutes to go. Five minutes to go. Uh, when will we know if racing goes ahead on Monday, Paul? That's the question everyone is asking because we don't have that go-ahead from government yet. I think Graham Dunshay on Luck on Sunday was brilliant on Sunday. Poor bloke. He's taken some stick at the BHA, but he looked like he hadn't slept for a week. The work that's gone in is clearly unbelievable. And he said, and these are the most reassuring words, that racing is being treated differently to other sports. So I'm very hopeful. We're not there yet. He said he was incre incredibly confident. That was brave. But I think we should know within the next 24 hours. It was always going to be late. It was always going to be a late call, but I'm very hopeful. And if we get going on Monday, then everything's going to happen. ITV will be back, ITV will be back next Friday and then Royal Ascot can go ahead. And I'm confident, cautiously confident, I think it's fair to say. Who is my favourite person to interview and why? Great question, Jenny. In football, it was Jose Mourinho because he was just such a challenge. In racing, we have challenges. Ryan's not the easiest. Um, but I love interviewing guys with big personalities. I've interviewed, just interviewed for Sporting Life, Steve Parkin. What an amazing guy he is. A man who was a miner. He was a man who just drove a van on his own in the early 90s, and now he's the executive chairman of the million pound business that is Clipper Logistics, who's told incredible stories about delivering PPE over the last few weeks. And he talks about his passion for racing, why he loves horse racing. I really enjoyed interviewing him, and hopefully this afternoon I'm going to interview Harriet Bethel, who took that horrendous fall and her smiling face is just going to light up people's screens at home. I'm excited about that. Dawn Goodfellow is a good interview, obviously. Um, who else have I enjoyed interviewing? Anyone with a big personality is good fun and racing's full of them. And football was much harder on the interview front. But that's, Jenny, that's a great question. Hopefully you've got a few good interviews to come. Some are a bit challenging. Maury, why is AP grumpy? He's just always grumpy, AP. That's the, his outlook on life, but he's also just a diamond of a guy. Um, and that's just, his, he's a lot less grumpy than he used to be. When he used to lose his races, my goodness me, so to um, lock himself in dark rooms, he's much more chilled out now. And he's, he, he'd hate me for saying it, but he's just the most awesome, generous and, and lovely bloke you could ever wish to meet. And hence, I put up with his grumpiness. And Jerry, you say you love the crack between us all. That's great to hear because we're a team. We're a team. Teamwork's so important. I made a rule, Jerry, when I joined ITV. Everybody, whether you're a Santa McCoy or one of the runners who made the team. We all meet together at six o'clock the night before racing. We obviously can't do it now, but the last three years and when normality returns, we meet at six o'clock. I insist upon it. Everyone has to be there. We have a production meeting and then we eat, drink, laugh together to create that team bond that is so important in any sport, in any way of life, in any business as well. And hopefully we've got a bit of that on ITV and hopefully it comes across uh, on screen as well. Uh, right, we've we got time for one more. There we go. The importance of racing welfare. Great question. Racing welfare. Keep doing what you're doing. Um, keep doing what you're doing for such important people as well. What you've done in lockdown, I talked about earlier, is so important. But what you're doing full stop is so important. And racing's lucky to have brilliant charities and full of brilliant people. And I can't wait, just to finally say, I can't wait over the next few weeks to tell racing stories. We are involved in the best sport in the world. And this is how I've presented so many different sports, everything from athletics to rugby and obviously, most recently to football and then racing. Racing's the best, and I want to present it for many years to come. Fingers crossed that happens. Fingers crossed you all stay safe and well. And listen, enjoy the racing. We're going to appreciate everything so much more after what everyone's been through. And when racing comes back, we hope on Monday, enjoy it. Please enjoy ITV's coverage. Feel a little bit of sympathy for me and the job I'm trying to do, because I hope I've explained just how difficult it is. And going from football to racing has been the biggest challenge of my career but I'm very proud of what ITV has done and hopefully will continue to do and I wish you all well and uh, keep in touch and enjoy the racing and stay safe. It is goodbye from me, have a lovely day. Cheers.